Black Hill Energy, heating homes across County Armagh. Fill up your tank for a rainy day with County Armagh's fastest growing fuel company. For latest prices, visit our website at www.blackhillenergy.net or call us today on 02838 344 Black Hill Energy, Ansborough Industrial Park, Lurgan. Welcome once again to the Eye on the Ball. This is your host Elaine Ingram. He's not a man that any athlete really wants to see too often, but he's certainly one that you want to have in waiting in the wings. And if you do happen to have an injury, he's definitely the man that you want to help get you back on track. Um, for this episode of the Eye on the Ball, we spoke to Newtown Hamilton physiotherapist Paul Carraher, who has been selected as one of Team Ireland's uh, physiotherapists for the Tokyo Olympics which has been rescheduled for next year. Paul is a well-known face in Armagh. He's won, he worked with the senior footballers and the minor footballers um, for over 13 years. Um, he had to quit that job a couple of years ago because he was under so much pressure with his, um, his own clinic that he runs in Windsor Hill and Uri and also with the work he's been doing within the Irish sports system and um, across a range of sports and with Athletics Ireland. Um, Paul's worked at the London Paralympics in 2012. He's been to the Rio Olympics with his job and he's been all around the world at European and World Championships. So we spoke to Paul about his own career and um, looking forward to the, the Tokyo Olympics and all of his own personal sporting achievements as well as lots of other things, including watching um, Usain Bolt run his last victory lap in London in 2017. It was a fantastic weekend for Camogie, uh, with the Armagh ladies team winning the junior championship in Brethley Park on Saturday, where they beat Cavan. It was a fantastic game and a brilliant result for these girls who've waited an awful long time for this. The last time Armagh won the All-Ireland was way back in 1993, um, so it's been a long time coming, but it was well worth the wait. Um, we caught up with two of the top players, um, player of the match, Kira Donnelly and her sister Leanne. Kira scored 13 points on the day and Leanne scored four. We got all the reaction from the game. But first of all, let's hear from Paul. How are you? It's very nice to meet you, Paul. You too, Leanne. I'm well, thanks. Um, I suppose I, the first thing I want to ask you about, uh, obviously, is the Olympics. Um, you're, you've been selected as the physio for the Irish Olympic team for next year. Yes, and um, obviously you were delighted with that. Was it a, a surprise call up, or were you? I know you've done work with them before in the in the um, Paralympics and stuff like that. Or how did it come about? It came about. I suppose I've been working within the the Irish um, sports system since two thousand and twelve now. So my, my first interaction with high performance sport would have been with Athletics Ireland. So I, I started working as one of their physios, travelling with their their teams to European and World Championships. Um, in around 2016, then I started working for the Sports Council, where I was working across a number of sports, so working with athletics, um, cycling, gymnastics and taekwondo. And in the, the, for Rio, I actually travelled um, to the, the Games with, as part of the Athletics Ireland team. Yeah. But because um, I was working across a number of different sports, um, yeah, yeah, I was approached to, to interview for one of the sort of team around um, central roles yeah and and so um you had the interview uh god it's, it's hard to think when that was now but um had an interview well it all went pear-shaped, it all went pear-shaped <laughs> more or less as a, um, afterwards um went through the interview process and then was appointed into um the the team around physio role after that yeah it's a it's a huge honor isn't it to be you know selected it is, yeah. It's was the interview process itself difficult? Were there a lot of people interviewing for the position? There would have been quite a lot of interest in it. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how many people um, applied for it. There was quite a, a strong shortlisting process. So you had to be able to demonstrate that you were working with, I suppose, a, a, a large number of the athletes that were expected to go to the Games. 
Yeah. So, you know, and because you were working amongst a number of different sporting, you know, it, it certainly put you in the the, the, the front foot in, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a wide variety of um, sports um, organisations that you've actually worked for. I mean, Arma obviously was the big one. Um, you worked with the minors and then you, and then the senior team for many years. Yeah, I started with the minors. I think it was in two thousand and four. Um, and that was with Paul Kelly was the manager, um, Brenton Hughes, Jim McCrory, and Dennis Hollywood from Newtown here as well. Right. Um, so that management team were together for, for three years. And then I went to the seniors with Peter McDonald in his first year with the seniors. Um, I was more or less with the seniors there through Peter's reign, um, Paddy Rook's time, uh, Paul Grimley and then with with Kieran McGinney in so more recent times. So, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you who your favourite was. <laughs> no, no <laughs> I'd have to answer no comment to that. I'm, I'm afraid, but um, I enjoyed that whole time with Arma. Um, yeah. Enjoyed the time. and Jim is still there now, obviously. Anyway, as well with uh, Kieran, Jim McCarry. Yes, yeah. and and Dennis as well, and actually. Dennis, yeah. yeah, so there was quite an overlap um, with different people from that minor team so Paul Kelly has been involved with the seniors at different stages while I was there um, Brenton Hughes was actually in with Paddy Rook at one stage so that core of I yeah. suppose um, three or four coaches um, were probably a bit of a, a consistent um, f- feature in, in my time with Arma. So you'd be very familiar with the players, especially if you were involved with the minors. Probably a lot of them would have been coming up through the ranks that day as well. Yeah, very much so. The, that sort of minor team um, from 2004, um, 2005, 2006, a, a lot of those became sort of more established players then as I um, was working with the seniors. Um, it is interesting now when you're sort of... Uh, I, I finished up with the, the seniors, I think it was two years now, and it it is interesting how quickly things move on so that you're seeing sort of new there's players a, there's kind there. of a lot of a new crop there yeah, as well absolutely. the younger yeah, the younger ones coming through it's great, it's great. Yeah, it just shows you how quickly things do move on so it's um, there are a lot of sort of faces or names that I wouldn't be as familiar with and that uh, you know haven't had that luxury of dealing with them as um, sort of development squads and minors which I would have had in the past um, but it's great to see that there's, a, there's plenty of talent coming through there yeah and would you see um, the same people presenting themselves with, the same, with similar injuries. I know there's some players that seem to be more prone to injury than others. Is that just uh, the way they... Do you think that's um, the way they train or is it just the look of the draw? There's a number of factors involved. Um, so probably one of the biggest risk factors for injury is your previous history of injury. Well, that's what I was going to say. So, if you, like if you break your ankle, the chance it's always going to be weak or something yes, like that. So, you know? so there, there's, there, there's definitely a, an element of that. Um, so when, when I suppose when people are looking at maybe team sheets and they see a name being out on a, on a recurrent basis, um, quite often if, for, for, for those players, it's, it's trying to break that cycle um, of the, the biggest thing that you can do to protect yourself against against injury is get a nice consistent block of training and if you're in and out um, of a, a, a squad or training squad as a result of injury it's, it's almost like a vicious circle so, so it's a chicken and an egg kind of a thing yeah yeah very much so it's trying to break that that cycle yeah um, and get a long enough period um where, where you're you're just getting consistent training on your belt um and quite often that can be uh, quite, quite a challenge well it's definitely a challenge now I mean do you find now that sport is coming back there's uh, a, a lot of injuries a lot more injuries because people are training by themselves as well so they might not be training exactly as you know they would be if they were in with their group and yeah there was certainly um, after lockdown um, you would have seen that um, where you'd you know, p- people sort of training by themselves when they, when they were used to a team environment um, so the training that they've been doing by themselves wouldn't have naturally reflected what their sport was actually asking yeah. of them. So and you say, couldn't even do that because you you know certain you things have you have to do with other people. And if Absolutely. You, yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, like going for a you know a five k run is very very different to what um, the demands of a, a football match are with the twisting and turning and the acceleration and the deceleration and the change of direction. So um, if you went through lockdown and had you know, two or three months of getting out um, for a 5k run you know, two or three times a week and you're thinking you're doing well you're keeping yourself in good shape but you get back into that 
um, sort of football training environment with the twist and turning and the acceleration and deceleration um, y- yeah it's, it's asking for trouble really if yeah. you haven't been exposing yourself yeah um, there isn't really that. very much you can do about that you know it's no no it's, 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 it's all about just gradually reintroducing that yeah. if you're not going from zero to a hundred which is hard when you've got matches or when you've, whatever sport it might be you know when you, ha- when you have an event or something coming up like you, you kind of you know you kind of have to get stuck in whether you like it or not at times you know and that's where uh, i suppose the you know, good managers and coaches will really um they'll really adapt to training to allow for that you know they'll, they'll, they'll sort of take um i suppose into account where the players are when they're coming back into that sort of collective training and where they need them to be and they'll try and um try and do that in a nice steady progressive manner um and uh, yeah it, it requires planning it requires a bit of forward thinking so um I think that's it's certainly a bit of a trend or a pattern that we've seen when the clubs got up and going. Um, we, we, like we we run a clinic in in Newry, and yeah. certainly there was um, there was quite a lot of club players now who were who were getting in contact. Um, those sort of first couple of weeks of the of the the club league starting. Yeah. Um, there was, there was yeah we, quite a lot. We were quite busy during I that I suppose period. as well with the leagues, they wouldn't have the same sort of. Um, people around them as you know wouldn't have the same sort of professionalism as with the county players so they would be much more looked after in yeah. terms of you know just having the having the people to do it you know that's true and it's um, i suppose when you when you're looking at a an inter-county um set up you've got you know, a number of different um yeah, disciplines or expertise of, there yeah. that can can help guide the players and sort of direct what what they're doing on their own time um, a lot of the clubs are definitely st- stepping up what their preparations are, but maybe not quite to that extent. Yeah. And um, yeah, I suppose the the outcome of that then is um, some of the club players when they were getting back into um, those club league matches starting, they maybe just weren't as well prepared as they potentially yeah. could have been. Well, in the type of injuries that you see, I know um, the the dreaded cruciate is seems to be a really bad one that you know has players out for a long time yeah and it's is there anything that can be done about that it's quite a common injury it's a, and you know it's a severe one isn't it it is it, it, the the effect it has on a player is quite you know it's quite significant and um, there's a there's a there's obviously surgery involved um in the majority of cases um and that in itself has its own risks um it's obviously got a cost um it, it impacts players directly afterwards that you know, if they're working, they're going to take a bit of time off work. Yeah. So there's a financial implications with that as well. Um, away from sport, from a sporting perspective, there is you know there's a, a, a quite a significant um, rehabilitation period involved. Yeah. After a cruciate I operation. I mean, it can take up to a year, can't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, and those that are probably been wise and sensible about it will take the full year out of it. You know, there is more more research coming out that um, if you try and rush that rehabilitation period, um, that you're Chances of re injury. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's there's quite strong evidence that those if you wait from um, from nine months every month you wait after nine months, providing you're following an appropriate rehab program, your your risk of re injury halves. So uh, it starts off you know reasonably high at nine months, drops down considerably by ten months, by eleven months, by twelve months. So it's it's definitely worth when you're um, my perspective anyway is you know. With most players going through that type of operation, it's be- definitely worth sitting down and planning out a, a quite an extensive rehab program, and um, that's going spanning across that whole time frame yeah. that you're not well, rushing. Cut corners. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, things like head injuries now, and um, that's another thing that's um, really come to the fore. And do you find over the years now, um, players? And I'm not I'm not just talking about football. I'm just talking about sports in general. Um, rugby stuff like that you know the players are bulking up more and more and all of their sports sports are becoming much more about physique uh, you know and size and everything do you find that there are more more head injuries or there's it's difficult to say if there's actually there's more, more study about them as exa- well. that, yeah that's exactly what I was going to say the, the actual injury incidents with regards to concussion I'm not sure if that's actually rose much but I think what's happening is um, the reporting of it so the, the awareness of 
the importance of you know, early diagnosis and management of head injuries and concussions. Um, it's improving year on year. So I think that's only a, a positive. You know, the more people that are um, aware of the potential problems with it, um, that, you know, that's a good thing. It, it's ensuring yeah. that more and more players, when they suffer those injuries, are getting the appropriate treatment. Um, that maybe wasn't the case, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, where the, the public awareness um, w- wasn't at a level that it is at now. Um, so quite often those type of injuries were maybe downplayed. Um, don't, there's not a visible a- aspect to it. you know. Yeah, so it's, but it can come back to... Like they're finding out more and more now that, mm. um, especially like with boxers being punch drunk and all that kind of thing, that it is it is bra- your brain injury. Brain yeah, injuries. no, it, it's 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 certainly um an injury that shouldn't be taken lightly. You know, um, any player of any age that sustains um a, a head injury, it's really important that they get the appropriate medical advice um and that the 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 appropriate management of that type of condition is where it should be. Yeah. And like I definitely think uh, rugby has probably led the, the charge in that regard. They're maybe a little bit ahead of certainly where um, football and, and soccer are. But I suppose there's a necessity there. There's a necessity the there. Um, but, but also the, that, that, that sort of gap's closing. You know, there's, there's more and more sort of education resources coming out from the GAA, from, from the uh, FAI and... It's all about the education. You know, it's, it's getting that message out to coaches, to players, to parents, and um, to teachers. And the more people that are well informed and what's you know what's involved, what the risks are, what the appropriate management is, um, really the better for for everybody. Yeah. And do you find now? I suppose the other um, sports that you do, Taekwondo. Do you find a lot of stuff like that in there? In I know it's a martial arts, you think, but there is an awful lot of discipline in, in uh, martial arts as well. So they're probably yeah, it's funny um, with it's taekwondo more discipline than football, you know, it is. knocking lumps out of each other. <laughs> it's funny. So, so with taekwondo, um, concussion is in the research is one of the um, highest reported injuries. Oh, it is, is it? But I'm only working with one taekwondo athlete, so it's a guy that's, that has qualified for the Olympics. Um, you know, he's a really talented athlete, um, Jack Wally from Dublin. Um, and touch wood, um, we haven't had a head injury with him okay, um, so far. So <laughs> ho- hopefully that's the case. So, um, yeah, as a sport, there is a, there, there's certainly a, a high risk of concussion in Taekwondo. But um, we've, so far, we've, we've been lucky enough to avoid it with, um, with that particular athlete. And who are you working with in the gymnastics end of things? So gymnastics um, is Rhys McLennan. Um, so Reese again, he's he's qualified for Tokyo. Um, he's a current world medalist. Um, actually did really well. He, he had shoulder surgery in two thousand eighteen, and w- was back competing within about seven months, and um, came back into really PB form um, and and medaled at the worlds. So um, the I suppose the 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 postponement of the Olympics was probably bittersweet for him you know he's going into it in really really good shape yes yeah, so that's the thing there's a real fine balance there now these all these athletes have to wait a year yeah so they're you know especially well you're probably lucky the, you're, you, the athletes you're dealing with are younger but if they were on the old, older scale of things you know say if they were going for yeah there's the, 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 like, so there, there's definitely the two sides to the coin there so f- for both Reese and Jack for example um, are very young athletes um, so Although they were both disappointed that the the games were postponed, and um, because they're so young, another year it's in their development, an advantage to them. it's a big Huge advantage. advantage to it's them. a big advantage for them, and even when you look but at the competition. But then again, it's the same with all their competition, I suppose. Yeah, well, no. So, so um, uh, competition in some aspects will be, and um, for both of those athletes, they're probably in the younger side of it. You know, okay. so, the, so yeah, so it, 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 it will work an advantage um, in in those two guys. Um, Athletics is a an interesting one, um, with some of the athletes that are sort of qualifying. That, that for athletics, the qualification process is still ongoing, so um, there's still chances for people to, to qualify. So there's a really talented group of um, junior athletes that have been through Athletics Ireland system um, the past couple of years, that most of them hadn't actually qualified for the 2020 Olympics. But the extra twelve months is a big opportunity for them. Yeah. Um. So they're allowed to sort of jump on board now. They can still, yeah. yeah they'll 
Well, because the process is still ongoing. It's still ongoing, so they'll still be pushing trying to get that qualification. Um, the flip side, as we talked about, is, is those athletes that were probably looking at 2020, maybe as their last games, due mm. to the sort of older, more experienced athletes. Um, and all of a sudden, what they expected to be doing now is sitting back in retirement and sort of feet up. They're facing into you know, another 12 months of hard training. So that's difficult um, for people at the you know, at the other end of their career. Um, and again, with that, knowing that they're going to have to train as hard as the war and maybe age, you know, age and time is against them, yeah. um, it, it probably generates quite a, a lot of, um, I suppose, mental challenges or psychological um, challenges for those sort of groups of athletes. Yeah, yeah, it must have been very disappointing when you found out that the whole thing was being postponed, but I suppose it was all up in the air then, and I suppose when it got the go-ahead next year, that was probably a big relief. Yeah, it, it was. Um, I suppose the, the initial response was, yeah, it certainly was one of disappointment. Um, you'd probably looked at a, a lot of the work that had sort of went on in the 12 months previously, and you're going, that's sort of just up in smoke. But it has probably standed to us um, in terms of that work that's been done and we can actually yeah. build on it um, even further. So um, the, some of the statements coming out from the IOC and, and the Tokyo Organization Committee in the past few weeks have been really encouraging. You know, they're really, um, yeah, they're really adamant that the, the games sure that are going to go ahead. Yeah. So when you're getting that from a reassurance... I mean, um, we're going to have hopefully a vaccine by then but the, the way things are going yeah anyway. yeah no so the, the news certainly over the past few weeks has been a lot more positive and um you know if you've been asking me maybe two or three months ago if the games were going to go ahead in 2021 i probably would have been giving you a 50 50 type yeah. answer but um yeah there's a lot more reassurance that um you know, this time next year we should have been through it and um hopefully yeah. we've had a successful games and what was your experience now you do in, with the um, Paralympics? I've probably had two previous Olympic roles. Right. So um, in Lon- London in, in 2012, I was over working as part of the LOC physio team. Um, so that was more of a... It was working for, um, yeah, for, for the London Organisation Committee. So I was working with um, countries that didn't have their own physios with them. So that was a... a probably a, a different experience um, as a, in 2013 I started getting involved in uh, athletics um, and so went to to Rio as um, a physio for the athletics team um, was based mainly in Uberlandia where which was the holding camp so an athletes um, arrived over to Brazil the more or less came to Uberlandia acclimatized there got the training done and then as it got closer to the competition, they flew from Uberlandia into Rio with themselves. So I was responsible for sort of, um, I suppose, the, the, the physio uh, service in that Holton camp. And we, when we had the last um, last athlete transit, transitioned into the, the village, then we, we travelled up to Rio. So um, one of the last athletes that was in the village was, again, it was the Newry connection, and was Breach Connolly. So she Breach was working in Newry at the minute. She was from Leithrum. Um, originally but uh, yeah so there's another local connection that was yeah. in Uberlandia did you get to have any fun over there it just sounds so exotic <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, probably a, a quite a big uh, misconception um, when I get just with families and friends in terms of you know, the, the, the places you go and the, the different trips and um, yes you get to see very little um, and yeah. you literally see the at, hotel the hotel um, the warm up area even so with athletics I've, like I say I've travelled all over the world with athletics and um, most of the competition I'm based in a like a warm up area which is almost like a second stadium so I don't get to see even much athletics um, much of the races you're, you're sort of you're based you've got your own st- sort of station and you, and you tend to sort of base yourself there for most of the day the exception to that then is um, as the the competitions go on and you become um, you only get eliminated <laughs> yeah less busy so you always get to watch um, the 4x1 yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, yeah we I suppose the Irish team haven't had a, a 4x1 men's team um, at a at a world championships in quite a while 
but um, that's always a nice event to yeah. you know you finished up and you get, get out to sea um, and that was one of the probably one of the highlights of the different trips so in the championships in London in 2017 um, it was Usain Bolt's last race oh brilliant and uh, and I knew it would be that the last night of the championship so you would know other Irish um, athletes would be be involved in that day so my wife and the kids actually came over for that and so they're all they're all in the stadium uh, for are you allowed to just do you have to get tickets now? how to get tickets now yeah, yeah so got, is it difficult to get tickets no it wasn't um, no it wasn't too difficult um, it was actually I'm not sure if you remember but it was um, there, there was the Norovirus outbreak um, oh. which is uh, d- during that yeah. um, during that championships it was um so it was, it was quite an interesting couple of weeks. Um, th- there was big enough crowds, but there were certainly some due b- because of that. Um, our own team hotel was actually locked down for that um, because there was an, an outbreak. There was an, an Irish athlete that would, um, had was affected as well. But um, yeah, you get sort of interesting sort of experiences like that. So that, that was one that I, I managed to share with the family. <laughs> so the, and, and when they actually came over, though... Um, Usain Bolt, he the four by one is normally on a the, the last evening, the Sunday, but he was racing in the final of the hundred meters on the Saturday and pulled his hamstring, so he didn't get the race in the four by one, but he did like a a, a, a a like a a victory lap as a farewell. So so that must be mad to see because you can see it on the television, but isn't it the same? What does it actually look like when you see Usain Bolt running around? Uh, Oh, yeah, it's fantastic, I mean, and and again, it must look so much faster than it does even on TV. It does, and probably we're, we're lucky in that regards as well. Um, with, with the I suppose the the medical accreditation you you, you can get um sort of moving around the stadium quite yeah. well. So, um, actually, we're in with a bunch of Jamaican athletes for that like oh, so you brilliant. had that so whole, you had the whole atmosphere the whole atmosphere the whole sort of um, I suppose festival experience for that which was, was yeah it was pretty special yeah yeah and you now yourself I know you um, your own sporting um, experiences and um, you triathlete you've done Ironmans tell us a bit, a bit about that yeah um, I did I've done three Ironmen um, yeah. Didn't do them particularly fast. <laughs> it was Doing just, them at all is a huge achievement. It was, yeah, yeah. It was, it was back sort of in around that 2013, 14, 15, that sort of time frame. Um, and it, how did you get into triathlon? I mean, you, you used to play football, right? You used to play football for Newtown. Again, didn't do that particularly well either. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're being modest now. And the, I got into triathlon. Um, the, the Newry Triathlon Club, it was through them. So there's a couple of families in Newry that um, I'd say if they counted the amount of people that they took into um, that sort of triathlon world, it would probably be in the hundreds. Um, yeah. So it was like Melon McCourt and Nathan McCourt and, and Aaron and then the Malins, Mickey Malin. You and just spoke to Parag Malin the other and day. Parag. In terms of uh, promoting sport in the Newry area, you, you know, like fantastic um family or families I know that, that they're I think they're related by marriage um but yeah it was them that sort of um, introduced me to triathlon um I think one of them may have been in the clinic um in Newry for treatment and more or less dragged me along to a, a, a swimming session with the with the triathlon club and just interest grew from there um so we started off um like most people with the Crooked Lake triathlon yeah. and uh did that and got bitten by the bug really right. went from there and it seems to be quite common that people that start off that they really do get bitten by the bug yeah well it's, it's, it's a I suppose group. if there's three disciplines you're always, you're always going to you know you have a bit of variety there you have the variety there and I, again probably when we're talking about injuries previously you, you, you it's, it's a great sport that it's, it's almost natural cross training you know so if you're running once a week and you're cycling once a week and you're swimming once a week, you're not doing too much of anything. Yeah. Um. So that risk of you know picking up injuries and niggles is much much less. Even if you do happen to pick up a bit of a a, a problem with your running, you can then concentrate on your cycling and your swimming. So it's it's certainly a it's a great sport from that perspective. Um. Certainly when you start getting a little bit more into it and you you go the Ironman route, 
um yeah, it, that's it, a different story it goes away bit yeah yeah but um yeah well explain the iron man now so uh, yeah it's that well it's not long since i've done one <laughs> i'd have to remember the swims approximately four kilometers i think 3.8 kilometers um and then the, the, the cycle is 112 mile and then a marathon to finish off yeah. with so it's it's a nice little marathon just to yeah but, but, <laughs> just but as a cool down but, but that time you're not glad to get off the bike that it's yeah, <laughs> it's a pleasure to start running um as yeah as Mel McCourt would have said it's, it's just like a long day's work you know so <laughs> you you just have to set out and pace yourself and um if you same as we talked about earlier the preparation done um how long would the training take for something like that um, you, you need to be sort of working away um, and building up to it over a, a prolonged period. Um, you, you know, like certainly the, the approach I took was the, the first year I got into triathlon, it was the shorter distance to sprint. Um, the second year, it was up to an Olympic distance, which is double. The third year, then I went to half Ironman. And then the fourth year, I went to the, the Ironman distance. Yeah. So if you were to follow my route, you'd say it probably takes four years to build up to it. Um, I'm sure there'd be people maybe that would be fitter and better shape just starting off that could do that um, in a much shorter time frame but um, if you're starting from a you know, complete scratch um, yeah. yeah that's probably the, it's probably the, the way most people um, have went in that sort of in that new area yeah mm. and you've given them up now yeah, well um, yeah uh, it was probably more through necessity than anything. It was just getting the time. Um, as the work sort of became more and more based down in Dublin, um, it left with me less. With the athletics, with, yeah, yeah. It left me less time to train. When I was sort of doing those sort of three Iron Men, I was probably based more in the clinic in Newark. So again, I had, you know, it would have been a case that I was able to. Um, dictate my own hours uh, yeah, maybe you know, f- out for a run at lunch time or finish up early and go out for a cycle and um, yeah. whereas you add on more or less three hours in the car it sort of it takes away that opportunity to, to, yeah. to train a bit and are you up and down to Dublin I suppose you're doing a lot now well, uh, well pre-lockdown I would have been up and down four days a week yeah. now I'm back to maybe two or three days um, certainly two days a week three days some weeks um, and it'll probably stay at that now until the new year. So I probably don't have any excuses at the minute. I should be <laughs> doing a little bit more. Well, I'm sure you're busy enough in the clinic anyway. Yeah, you know. How did you actually get into physio in the first place? Um, it, it, it was, again, just through personal experience. Um, I had picked up an, an injury and um, Dennis Hollywood, um, who I mentioned earlier, um, sent me to a physio in Belfast that he knew. Um, and that was my first experience was physio it was in around that time where you're you know in school and a levels and you're doing UCAS forms and applying for different courses yeah and so yeah from that uh, um, it sort of sparked my interest and uh, I applied for the course in Jordanstown and um yeah I got a place and went from there really and you obviously really enjoy it yeah yeah no it's it's because you get to meet a lot of people as well you, you meet know. a lot of people um it's, it's it's one of those things that you like the what you sort of consider work and um, when you're doing it sort of you know on a regular basis you sort of maybe take it for granted um, and it's only when you sort of look back at it a little bit and you go god that's, that's a pretty pretty cool job to be involved in yeah you know, definitely the, the travel and the, the different sporting experiences and yeah yeah those. and meeting a lot of you know you know a lot of different athletes and yeah. you know a lot of stuff like that so you're really looking forward now to heading off to Tokyo have you any um anything I know you say you don't get to see much or when you're there but is there anything you're going to go out of your way to see when you're going all that distance you you, you can you get to stay on any longer or anything like that um generally not no so like it's a, a long way to go it's for a long way to go and to um, not see anything <laughs> The, the, the games is maybe slightly different than your normal um your normal championships so if we if we go to say an athletics championship you're more or less you're away for a week two weeks at the most and it is fairly intense um the games um like the total i could be gone for five or six weeks for that so we will have to factor in i suppose downtime um when you're away that length of time so um 
as I haven't looked at it yet, but uh, yeah, it'll, be, it'll certainly be something. I'll maybe try and factor in that, maybe see the sets or something yeah. in one of those days off, just to get out of the the whole bubble of the athletes' village. And yeah, the, and but the athletes' village is meant to be great. It's yeah. It, listen, it's it, it's it is a very um it's a, it's a very surreal sort of experience. Um, it's almost like a sort of goldfish bowl. You know, it's very um pressurized and that bubble sort of scenario the outside world nearly gets forgot about to a certain extent yeah. um, so it's yeah it's one of those things that yeah and I suppose you think like the amount of people in the world that are actually watching everything and you're yeah at the centre of all that and you the, the sort of ringside view so to speak yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's but like, you're in the centre of the storm at the same time so you yeah. don't get to yeah, yeah. You're in the eye of the storm kind of thing but there are are there any any is there anybody particularly that there are any sports that you want to see when you're over there that you you won't know what way your schedule is going to be um we'll have to have that all sort of planned out um in advance so like that's you know one of the jobs we're sort of doing at the minute is looking at the the different competition schedules and um, also looking at the athletes that we work with um, yeah. and seeing where the clashes are you know yeah. so certainly those athletes that you work closely with um you, you you'd like to be able to see them compete you don't always get that chance you would maybe that um you could be working with somebody else at the yeah same time so we, what we also have to do is um like risk stratify each event so um and you where the need for the the physio cover is mm. so that there'll be a if you if you take say for example maybe gymnastics and badminton um there'll, there'll be a a higher risk of a serious injury in, in gymnastics and um, if, if gymnastics and, and bantam were on the same day and we had to sort of prioritize one event over the other we yeah, gymnastics is something you're more likely to be needed yeah so i'm probably in a lucky situation that the sports that i am involved with um would be would carry a higher risk so it would be probably yeah. deemed as a higher priority for physio cover so yeah. the chances of me actually being there as the athletes I work with um, are It'd competing be high, yeah, will be yeah, higher. Yeah. Um, the, 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 so the, the way we sort of split our day up is that you know, during the day it'll be it will be that it'll be competition cover, um, and then evenings we run sort of treatment clinics. So, um, the, you know that and that's where we'll do probably most of our work in terms of um, any of the athletes, be it from again athletics or gymnastics or um, taekwondo that need any treatment and yeah. um, we'll have sort of scheduled slots in around that and uh, and that's what we spent most of our evenings at yeah okay well um it was really nice talking to you paul thanks Liam. Nice and talking to you. i hope everything goes ahead uh, next year according to plan and the irish team all do really well fingers crossed and you don't, they're not they don't need you too much <laughs> okay thanks paul thanks Liam. and now let's hear from armac Camogues. Kira and Leanne Donnelly after their huge victory over Cavan in the Junior Championship final in Breffney Park on Saturday. Hey girls, can I get a few words for yeah. your mind? What, me too? Yeah, Aww. why not? <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, I suppose, you know, how, how is it the difference? What is the difference between uh, like being sisters out there? Is it, are you like, do you read each other's minds or um, <laughs> is there uh, any of that going on? I don't know about that, but, um, you know, we have been sort of in each other's pockets now for the last, what, how long have you been playing? Five. Since 2016. Five, four or five years now. And um, there is probably a little bit of that, but I think we can say things to each other that we might not be able to say, you know, to Who's girls. older? Me. You're older. Okay. <laughs> Just five. How many years? Yeah. Yeah. Nearly Nine. ten. <laughs> So uh, she's the spring chicken between the two of us, but um, no, it's it's fab to have to have the sport and to have the you know we're to and from from training um, together, and it's good to have that company. And I think we do nearly know what sort of moves we're going to make. Um, we need to nearly at this stage, but uh, yeah, it's great to have have the wee sis by by her side. Maybe that's a name only, not the <laughs> uh, Yeah, definitely. Like Kira, she was basically the one that brought me through my camogie career till now and um, so it was just great so to you're play like, out there today and just just we just ping off each other I feel like because today we 
we're all right, like. But anyway, um, but yeah, it's, it's a great it's a full team effort. You know, it wouldn't. Yeah. You know, obviously with the rest takes of the girls, 15. it takes, it takes the, 30, squad, 30, the thirty-four of us. girls that were up between on the pitch and on the bench today. Um, it's just been a massive effort by everybody. You know, everybody's made sacrifices, and we're just so glad that we've come out on the right side to bring a little bit of joy home to to all of our families and everything this year. So yeah. And did you know, um, you know, when you start when you start playing and it starts to go over, is there just a feeling that this is just going to be one of those days where everything's just going to go right? Because you miss very little, and you were get, you got a few yourself there. Well, I think at half time we were like we were three points up, and we thought we could keep going, but then Calvin just came out of nowhere in that third quarter, and then we just re. Reset. Come. Yeah, I think you didn't every, panic with the goals, so you didn't. the goals did go in, and, and it it was a wee bit worrying. My heart was in my mouth, you know, standing at the other edge of the pitch. But you know, I trust in the girls and every belief that you know they'd be fit to battle down the hatches when it when it came to the bite. And you know, just in the last the two frees that they hit in there at the end, it was it was very very touch and go. But um, thank God, the girls held strong, and and we come out with the win in the end. Yeah. And this year. The year it's been for everybody, you know, it's just crazy. And then on top of the, that, uh, losing Mary McStay, our president, and uh, Kerry Devlin, that's our goalkeeper there. She's went through, you know, obviously a very tough time in the last little while. And, you know, hopefully Camogie has, has helped her through that. And I, like I was saying, we're in awe of her just being able to come out and um, wear that jersey. And, you know, she stood strong there today. She didn't drop the head when the goals did go in. And only for her puck outs as well, you know. There could have been a serious, serious difference today. So um, we're just so happy that that we had something to celebrate at the end of 2020. Yeah, yeah it's been a long time. Cel- big celebrations tonight. So. Well, Nin- so was, it ni- was it 93 the last? 93. Majority of that team wasn't probably born. I think there's maybe about four or five of us that were actually born the last time they won yeah. it. So it is. It's a massive achievement, and the youth that there is in that team, and the youth that there is in the county, and the talent that there is in the county. We just hope this will be a driving force for next year, and and build on on this momentum, and get out and get stronger and get better. Because um, I definitely think there's there's more in this bunch of girls. Another year in junior, I think this is our stepping stone to getting better and to be able to move, you know, make that step up. So hopefully this will inspire girls that might be watching at home today to to put on, want to put on the Armagh jersey because I have no doubt that that we can do a lot more damage in in the next few years. Hopefully. Well, well, right. thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Eye on the Ball. If so, subscribe to our podcast and to Arma Eye. If you've any suggestions about what you'd like to hear or any comments at all, feel free to send us a message or leave a comment. And I hope you'll join me next time for The Eye on the Ball. Black Hill Energy, heating homes across County Armagh, Fill up your tank for a rainy day with Count de Armagh's fastest growing fuel company. For latest prices, visit our website at www.blackhillenergy.net or call us today on 02838 344 223. Black Hill Energy, Ansborough Industrial Park, Lurgan.